I am a perpetual traveler through the Bible. Please join me for the next part of my journey through the scriptures. Stay as long as you like and let us together discover a bit more about the Bible. In the last episode, we were introduced to the letter of Jude, neatly tucked in between John's three letters and the Revelation. We learned from verse 3 that Jude had intended to write a letter containing all those things that pertain to the salvation of us all. But news had come to him of an outbreak of some false and very dangerous teaching within the church. He felt prompted by the Holy Spirit to stop the original letter that he was going to write and to write the short and to the point letter, focusing instead on the danger of apostasy within the church. Jude warns the readers about ungodly men who had infiltrated their way amongst God's people rather casually and unnoticed. In verse 8, Jude tells us what is wrong with these men. Yet, in like manner, these people also, relying on their dreams, defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. Jude goes into deeper details in verses 9 through 13 and deals with them in reverse order. Firstly, blaspheming the glorious ones. Jude refers to an incident that is not recorded in our Bible. This incident comes from a book called The Assumption of Moses, which is part of the collection of religious writings called the Apocrypha, some of which were familiar to the readers of the first century. These writings are a mixture of truth and error, and what Jude is referring to is perfectly true, but not everything in the Assumption of Moses is. Later, Jude also quotes from the book of Enoch, another book which is also not part of our Bible, but is part of the Apocrypha. The quotation Jude uses is true, but the entire book from which it is taken is not. The incident recorded in the Assumption of Moses tells the story of what happened when Moses died. Michael, the archangel, had a dispute with the devil over the body of Moses. The claim of the devil was twofold. He said he had a right to the body of Moses because firstly Moses was a murderer as he had slain an Egyptian. Secondly, the devil said the body of Moses belonged to him because it was in the realm of physical things that he controlled. The archangel Michael disputed this. He claimed the body for the Lord God. Throughout scripture it states that our bodies are important to God. God has a plan for them as well as for the soul and the spirit. Jude was making the point that even the archangel Michael did not speak directly to Satan when he confronted him face to face, but simply said, The Lord rebuke you. Jude's reasoning was that if archangels who have so much power and knowledge of truth would be careful to respect the God-given dignity of a fallen angel, albeit Satan, then why should men speak with contempt of the principalities and powers in the high places? It is a sobering thing to consider people today who just sneer at the idea that the scriptures actually present the existence of demons or Satan. The second fault of these men that Jude is addressing is rejecting authority. Verse 11 says, Woe to them, for they walked in the way of Cain, and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error, and perished in Korah's rebellion. Jude again uses the example of three Bible characters to show the way rebellion and sin develops in our lives. He uses the example of Cain, Balaam, and Korah. Jude speaks of the way of Cain which is fundamentally selfishness. Cain was a perfect example of the man who thought only of himself, who had no concern or love for his brother, and had no qualms about murdering him. He looked out only for his own welfare, and Jude says this selfishness was the first step to rebellion. Jude then speaks of the error of Balaam. There are two stories about Balaam in the Old Testament. In the book of Numbers, chapter 22, verses 21 to 35, a pagan king hired Balaam, a wicked prophet, to curse the children of Israel. He was riding on his donkey on the way to curse the Israelites, and the donkey stopped because he saw the angel of God blocking the way. Of course, Balaam did not see the angel, and finally the Lord God opened the donkey's mouth to speak with a human voice in order to rebuke the prophet. One thing that you should spot with this account is the greed of this man Balaam. This is proved by the second story in Numbers chapter 31 verse 15. In return for money, 
Balaam had taught the children of Israel how to sin by sending the pagan women into the camp to seduce the men of Israel sexually, therefore introducing them to the worship of idols, which involved sexual activities. Balaam was guilty of teaching others to sin. Jesus said in Luke chapter 17 verses 2, Temptations to sin are sure to come, but woe to the one through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea than that he should cause one of these little ones to sin. The first step of utter selfishness, then secondly teaching someone else to sin, ends finally in the final defiant rebellion of Korah. The story of Korah's rebellion can be found in Numbers chapter 16. Korah and his supporters were the ones who said to Moses, We have had enough of your presumption. You are no better than anyone else. Everyone in Israel has been chosen of the Lord, and he is with all of us. What right do you have to put yourselves forward, claiming that we must obey you, and acting as though you were greater than anyone else among all these people of the Lord? Korah openly and blatantly challenged the God-given authority of Moses and Aaron. God's judgment of Korah's rebellion was terrifying. Moses had hardly finished speaking the words when the ground suddenly split open beneath them, and a great fissure swallowed them all up, along with their tents and the families and the friends who were standing with them, and everything they owned. So they went down alive into Sheol, and the earth closed about them, and they perished. Jude now tackles the third matter in verse 12. Jude now tackles the third matter in verse 12, defiling the flesh that was mentioned first in verse 8. He says that these people are hidden reefs or blemishes at your love feasts, as they feast with you without fear, shepherds feeding themselves. Love feasts are special meals, what we might call today potluck suppers. In the early church, the Christians would gather together and bring the food with them to the service on Sunday. After the service, they would all share and eat together, and they called this a love feast. These love feasts were wonderful times of fellowship, but then people began to divide into cliques, and some of them kept the best food for themselves, and soon there was division and these people began boldly parting together, looking after themselves, and thus brought disrepute on the character of the church. Jude, like his brother James and natural half-brother the Lord Jesus Christ, was a master of using all the events and scenes of life around him as word pictures. Jude describes these useless people as clouds without water, promising rain but never producing, swept along by the winds, autumn trees without fruit, doubly dead, which is a reference to both the physical and spiritual death of false teachers, uprooted and lifeless, wild waves of the sea, flinging up their own shame like foam, wandering stars, for whom the gloom of deep darkness has been reserved for ever. In verse 14 and 15, Jude quotes Enoch, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Jude describes these people as grumblers, malcontents, following their own sinful desires. They are loud-mouthed boasters, showing favoritism to gain advantage. That certainly sounds a lot like some people that we know. Perhaps some of us are guilty of some of these same wrong attitudes. From verse 17, Jude immediately comforts the readers by reminding them of something that the apostles warned them about. They said to you, in the last time, there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people, devoid of the Spirit. He also tells them immediately what to do about it. Firstly, make sure about ourselves first. Before we try to tackle anyone else, always make sure that we are what we ought to be ourselves. God is saying, Church, put yourself right and then you can put the world right. Firstly, in verse 20, Beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith. This means study your Bible and learn what the truth is. Jude does not tell them to throw these people out of the church. He says to oppose them with the positive, to learn the truth and to proclaim the truth. 
Secondly, Jude speaks about praying in the Holy Spirit. Notice the tenses of these two words, building and praying. Both these are the ongoing present tense in Greek. This indicates that this is a continuous activity that does not end or complete. To pray in the Holy Spirit does not mean to pray in an unknown language, as some teachings within the Pentecostal or Word of Faith movement interpret chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians. But this means to pray according to his teaching and in his power depending on God. Jude is saying that we ought to study and learn what prayer is and follow the teaching of the scripture about it. In other words, obey the Holy Spirit in your prayer life. Thirdly, he says in verse 21, Keep yourselves in the love of God. This verse has often been misinterpreted, with some people thinking that it depends on us to stay in the family of God, as if our salvation depended completely on our actions. What Jude is actually saying is comparing God's love to the sunshine. We can retreat to the shade or hide under umbrellas to block the sun. In John 15 verses 10, Jesus assures us that we will abide in his love if we keep his commandments. In the story of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15 verses 11 to 24, he went to a pagan country that was far from his home. But in that country, the prodigal son was unable to enjoy the benefits of his father's love. However, when he returned home, he enjoyed the love his father lavished on him. Believers need to keep themselves in the love of God to fully enjoy our heavenly Father's love. Finally, in the second half of verse 21, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. This, of course, refers to the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. It simply means continuously living in an eager anticipation of the Lord's return, with all the hope of eternal life. The verb here waiting in Greek is prosdechemai, and it means to wait with great expectancy. In other words, we ought to live every moment ready for Jesus to come at any moment and never to be ashamed if he were to appear at any second in our lives. Judas told us how we should conduct ourselves, but what about other people who might be pulled into apostasy? Again, Jude mentions three things concerning our attitudes and behavior towards those people. Verse 22 says, And have mercy on some who are doubting. The Greek word translated as mercy is eliarte, which has a meaning of being compassionate. Those who doubt need to be handled with compassion. Answer their arguments, reason with them, and help them to embrace the truth. Look at the way the Lord Jesus dealt with Thomas, who was full of doubts in John 20. Now, Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, and see my hands and put out your hand, and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen, and yet have believed. Jesus dealt with Thomas's doubt with compassion. He did not chastise him for doubting, or not accepting the word of the other disciples, but dealt with Thomas's weakness. Thomas had the need for the physical proof of Jesus' resurrection. Then Jesus revealed to him a better way of faith as described in Hebrews 11 verses 1, which is, Faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. The second group of people have to be handled differently. This is what verse 23 says, Save others, snatching them out of the fire. These are those people who have passed the doubting phase are convinced and have already bought into the lies. The language here is very graphic. They are already being singed by hell. Gentle, compassionate mercy is now exchanged for a rescue mission. The word snatch in Greek is harpazo, which means to take by force, to carry away, to attack. The language used here is not gentle. 
we are literally snatching them out of the fire. We cannot save anybody. Verse 25 says, To the only God, our Savior. God does the saving, not Jude, not the pastor, nor any church members. God is the ultimate source of salvation. We are just the mechanism through which he chooses to work. We are the tools he uses. Jude's brother James says exactly the same thing in his letter. In James chapter 5 verses 19 he says, My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. And then the final group is mentioned in the second part of verse 23. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. These apostates are deeply deceived, and very often they are articulate, and have been trained to articulate their system of deceit. They know how to give the answers. They are the teachers of their own lies, and when true believers get near them, it is a dangerous place to be. Jude says that we have to hate even the garment polluted by the flesh. The Greek word used here for the garment is chitona. This is the word for underwear. You wouldn't pick up someone's filthy stained underwear because you wouldn't want to be polluted by that physically. Jude is saying that we have to treat these false teachers in the same way because what comes out of them is a filthy pollution and if we get too close, we will be corrupted by it. Now, at the end of the letter in verses 24 and 25, we have one of the most well-known benedictions of the entire New Testament. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Even this benediction has three parts. The first is, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. Jude does not say, Now to him who does keep you from stumbling. God does not always keep us from stumbling. He is able to, but he does not always do it. We all need to fall sometimes, because some of us will not learn any other way, because of our thick-headedness and stubbornness. If we would obey him, he would keep us from stumbling. Even when we do stumble, the second part is a comfort and an assurance. He is able to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. The Greek word translated as blameless is the word amomos, which means unblemished and faultless. God has so completely covered us that even our falls have already been dealt with in Christ. Our stumbling will always have a painful lesson, and that is as it should be, but God is able to wipe it from the record and to present us faultless before his glory. This is done, Jude says, with great joy. This means that we have had a part in this too. Like Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 4 verses 7 to 8, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Jude concludes his letter with a final fanfare of praise to God. To the only God, our Saviour through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion and authority, before all time and now and forever. Amen. He describes God as the only God our Saviour. Although the apostates and rebellious non-believers have worshipped only themselves, there is actually only one God. And all who trust in his son Jesus he rescues from their sin. It says so in Acts chapter 4 verses 12. Jude's letter describes men at their worst and God at his best. Believers are on the side of victory. Jude gives all credit to the only God. There is only one. The only God who is our Saviour. Our Saviour through Jesus Christ. Our Saviour through Jesus Christ, who is our Lord. To Him belongs all glory, majesty, dominion and authority. Everything belongs to Him. We are there because He kept us, He preserved us and He presented us. This is David Wiles. 
your fellow traveler in Christ, and this has been the Journey Through the Scriptures podcast, episode 17.